Hey, Grace Hill family, hope you're doing well today. Hey, listen, we lost the sermon on Psalm chapter one. We didn't get a recording of it. So I just thought I would toss the camera on and re-record it so we could have it in our library. So if you're listening to this for the first time, just encourage you to grab a Bible, open it up to Psalm chapter one. One This past Sunday, we started what will be a sermon series that we do on and off probably for several years through the book of Psalms. And so we just started in Psalm chapter one, and we'll get a few Psalms done this summer. And maybe over uh, the weeks, even after summer, we'll come back to a Psalm here and there. And then just over the years, uh, we'll create a catalog, um, a library of uh, all 150 Psalms. Also, before we, we jump in, just wanted to point out the artwork behind me. Really excited. We're having lots of different artists in our church uh, create artwork for each of the Psalms that we're preaching through. So thanks to Mallory Frazier for creating uh, a painting for Psalm chapter one for us. And maybe as we compile these, we can even, even put together a Grace Hill devotional uh, or something like that. Um, that would just be a blessing to all of us. Uh, Psalm chapter one today. Um, you know, the Psalms, uh, what I love about them is that they invite us to bring all of ourselves to God. Psalms are a collection of prayers and songs to God. And these prayers and songs are all over the place. I like to say that the Psalms are all over the place because we are all over the place. As we read through these Psalms through the years, we're going to see people expressing all different kinds of things to God, praise and thanksgiving and anger and frustration and anxiety and all kinds of stuff. And so the Psalms invite us to do that. Now, Psalm chapter one acts like a preface to the entire Psalter. And we're going to get into why that's really important in just a few minutes as we read it. So it it's a little different than the rest of the Psalms. It doesn't read like a prayer or a song. It reads more like instruction because it really is acting like a preface. And so we'll get into that in just a second. But Psalm chapter one is six verses. And so I'm going to read this two verses at a time. I've got two uh, verses and then one point for each of those. So it'll be three readings and three points. Pretty simple. We'll work our way through. Psalm 1. So why don't you uh, look at verses 1 and 2 with me. We'll just look at it on the screen as well. Psalm chapter 1 verses 1 and 2. It starts out like this. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. Now, Psalm chapter one talks about someone who is blessed. Who, who is the one that is blessed? And obviously the answer that we get is this person that delights in the law of the Lord and meditates on it day and night. And now when you see this word law here, the law of the Lord, uh, just insert into there the instruction of the Lord or even the word of God. So the person that is blessed is the person that delights in God's word and meditates on on God's word. Now, we need to talk about this word meditate. Um, I think when we think of the word meditate, uh, all kinds of images might come into our head and we might have different expectations with that. So maybe when you hear the word meditate, you think of study, like deep study. You know, I got my colored pencils out and my commentaries and I've got my coffee and we're ready to go into a deep session of studying God's word. And so when you see meditates on the word day and night, you think there's two of that going on, two study sessions happening a week or a day. Um, maybe when you think of the word meditate, you think of breathing exercises and quieting your mind and your body and and maybe fixating on a passage of scripture or something like that. You know, maybe you think of candles burning and nice soft music. I don't know. We all have these different images that come into our head with this word meditate. But here's what I want you to know. And this is my first point for our sermon today. And that's this. Point number one is you are what you meditate on. You are what you meditate on. We need to talk about what meditate means 
in this passage of scripture. What is the Hebrew word for meditate here? It's the Hebrew word Hagah. And it's really interesting. It really doesn't mean all of the things that we've come to expect with the word meditate. This word Hagah means to utter, to mumble, to growl. Um, it means to ruminate on something. So it, it's almost like the, the, the best way I could describe it is like getting a song stuck in your head, right? I was just last week, I was traveling with uh, Evan. We were in the Dominican Republic visiting um, some missionaries there that we support and going to the graduation of the Hispaniola Institute of Theology. It was a fantastic trip, but we were driving around the Dominican Republic and we were listening to music and the song, Come On Eileen by Dexy's Midnight Runners came on. And that song was stuck into my head the entire trip, right? I kept on mumbling it to myself. Come on Eileen. And I I don't know any of the other lyrics to that song. I actually looked up those lyrics before I even mentioned it in my sermon and realized it's kind of an edgy song. But I don't even know what I was singing, but it was stuck in my head. It was kind of swirling in there and I was kind of mumbling it uh, as I went about my day because there was some meditation happening. But there's more, there's more colors to this word, haga. Um, it, it can also mean to plot or devise a plan. Um, Psalm chapter 2, which we'll study next week, verse 1, starts out with, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? And that word to plot something is also this same word, Hagah, this word to meditate. So it almost is like looking at something, but, but looking at all angles, thinking about it from every single perspective, uh, uh, almost obsessing over something. And so as we look at this word, what it means to meditate means to fixate on something so much that it's kind of always swirling in our head, to look at it from all angles. I almost think of a dog gnawing on a bone and it just fixates on it and just gnaws and gnaws and gnaws until it gets every last piece of flesh off of the bone. And that's really what it means to meditate. So meditation simply isn't study. Meditation simply isn't a kind of appointed time where we sit and quiet ourselves. No, actually, when we think about meditation, the truth is, is that we are always meditating. It's not if we're meditating or not. The question is, what are we meditating on? See, when we see he meditates day and night, this isn't meaning that he has two major study sessions of God's word a day. No, it means that God's word is something he's fixated on so much that it's always kind of in his head. And the question for us today is not if we meditate or not, but the question is what we meditate on because we're designed to be people who meditate. We're designed to be people who consume content. And then that content has an impact on who we are as we meditate it. Because the product of meditation is not just knowledge. The product of meditation is it does something at the gut level. It gives us a gut level emotional response to whatever it is that we're meditating on. So when we go to verse two right here, <clears throat> it shows us that this meditation day and night is producing delight. The object of the meditation is the word of God and the gut level response to that is delight in the word of God. But see, the question, as I said, is what are we meditating on and what is it doing to us? Because we are what we meditate on. What are we meditating on and what is it doing with us, to us? Uh, if you've ever heard of a flywheel, a flywheel is kind of a, uh, a mechanical um, 
uh, device that's usually inside engines and transmissions and stuff like that. It's a circular device that rotates. And the way it's designed, it's able to conserve its rotational energy. So as it gets more and more momentum, it's able to spin faster, 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 and faster and maintain its energy and its momentum. And I think meditation is a lot like a flywheel inside of us. As we meditate on something, it creates an emotional response in us. And as we experience that emotional response, it causes us to meditate even more on that thing. And then that creates an even stronger emotional response in us, which causes us to meditate even more. And it's kind of like a flywheel that's gaining more and more momentum. Meditation creating an emotional response, which causes more meditation. So let me give you some examples. You know, as I have told uh, many of you before, uh, I uh, last year had the opportunity to become a part owner of a CrossFit gym. And so uh, I do that and, it, and it's fun. Um, but I remember when I did that, um, someone came to me and was like, hey, and you know who you are. And it was great advice, by the way. Someone came to me and said, hey, you really need to look up this guy named Alex Hormozzi. Uh, Alex Hormozzi is a former gym owner and he's just a business um, guru and he puts out lots of content on YouTube and podcasts and all this stuff, books. He writes books about business and he's like, man, you need to go look at what this guy's saying. I think it could really help you as you do this, as you own this small business. And so I started to consume his content, YouTube and podcasts and books and articles and all this stuff. And I, it's really good stuff. It's really helpful. And so I consumed a lot of it, a lot of it. And it was always swirling around in my mind. I was meditating on it and it was creating an emotional response in me. It was creating some drive in me, but I also found myself, the more I meditated on it, I found myself feeling inadequate. I found myself feeling like I wasn't hustling hard enough. And so because of that, I meditated more on his stuff and I tried to implement more and read more and watch more, which created even more emotional response inside of me. And that flywheel started to spin faster and faster to where I had to step back and say, this is unrealistic. All right, I need to, I need to have a more balanced approach to this side project in my life. But the object of that meditation was doing something to me. Think about conflict in your relationships. Or if you have a person that you're frustrated with or someone that's really hurt you, it can be easy to meditate on that, to always be playing in your head what they've done to you, to talk to other people about what they've done to you, to be always thinking about the ways they frustrate you or the ways that you don't respect them. And so that's a form of meditation and that's going to produce an emotional response in you. Bitterness. And that bitterness is going to cause you to meditate on it more and more. And that flywheel is going to keep going. Think about the news. How much of us consume news, cable news, opinion shows, all of the time and they all want the same thing for us. They want us to be angry. They want us to feel like that the world is coming to an end. They want us to think that whatever is about to happen is the first time this has ever happened and this is the most unprecedented thing in the world and every single week is something unprecedented. And so that's a form of meditation. And that's going to create an emotional response in us, fear, anxiety, rage, anger, which is only going to cause us to meditate even further on it. And that flywheel is going to keep spinning. This is what pornography does. The more we meditate on these images, it's going to form an emotional response in us. It's going to form what we find attractive. It's going to form our expectations. It's going to literally change our brains, which will cause us to meditate even more on it. And it keeps spinning. We can talk about the social media rabbit hole of endless scrolling, uh, a scrolling of reels just over and over and over again. I mean, how many of us have found ourselves sitting on the couch scrolling reels and you realize, wow, an hour and a half just went by and I've just been mindlessly scrolling these reels, meditating, which is going to create an emotional response in us. 
That emotional response might be, I don't know, inadequacy, might be some body image stuff. Maybe it's stuff like, man, I'm a terrible mom. Look at these reels by these other moms. Or man, I'm a terrible dad. I'm a terrible business owner. I'm a terrible this or that. Because of all this content that we're watching, which just causes us to meditate even more. I think we get the point. I mean, we could just go on and on with examples of things we meditate on and what it is doing to us. This is what trauma does to us. See, sometimes we don't even have a choice on the things that we're meditating on. When we experience trauma, when we experience hard things, those are things that get lodged inside of us, in our heads, in our hearts, and it can become an object of meditation that we really even can't help but go to it, which creates a response inside of us. It's exactly what trauma does. See, it's not if we're meditating. The question is, what are we meditating on and what is it doing to us? And the more we meditate on things like the, the world and, and sin and trauma and, and all of this stuff, it's going to suck us into this emotional place that's the opposite of delight, which would be dismay. Actually, in verse 1, let me show this to you real quick. We see this kind of progression in someone's life as they meditate on the things of the world, things that are sinful. Look at, look at verse 1. We see a progression. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. So we first get this example of a man walking in the counsel of the wicked. So uh, imagine this is a man who is taking the advice, the counsel from sinful people. So he's taking advice from sinful people, but it keeps going, nor stands in the way of sinners. And so now I'm not walking in the counsel of the wicked, I'm standing in that way. I, I'm more rooted in it, meaning I agree with that advice. So I, I no longer am just taking the advice, I, I agree with it. And then it says, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, meaning I'm no longer just taking the advice or I no longer just agree with it, but I actually will mock those who don't agree with it. I'm going to mock those who walk in the way of righteousness. And we see this progression of meditation on the things of this world, what it will do to us on the inside. And that leads me to the second point that I have for us today. And that is this, that God wants something different for you he wants to bring delight to your soul. Look at verses three and four with me. It says this, he, this is the, the person that is blessed and meditates on the word of God day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. See, when we meditate on God's word, as we read in verses one and two, it does something to us. It, it brings delight to our souls. And I think this word delight is defined here in verse three. What, what does it mean to, to, to have delight? Well, in verse three, we see that he's like a tree planted by streams of water, meaning that this, this tree is always rooted. It's always receiving nutrients. And because it's always receiving good things for it, it is, one, able to yield its fruit in season. It is useful. The things that it's gifted in doing, it's able to do for good and right purposes. And, and for us to have delight in our souls, we want to be used in amazing purposeful ways. Its leaf does not wither, meaning that as the tree or the person experiences suffering and hardship and hard things in life, that it's being cared for in the midst of those seasons of life. And therefore, it's still able to stand and, and be nourished. And then finally, in all that he does, he prospers. And this is a biblical kind of prosperity, not a worldly prosperity. Uh, the biblical prosperity is when we can truly enjoy the good gifts of life as we trust God and his love for us and we can find our security in God. And this is what delight is. Defined for us here in verse 3. 
Now, I said earlier that Psalm chapter 1 acted like a preface to the rest of the Psalter. And there's a reason why I think that this acts like a preface to the rest of the Psalter, because as we read the Psalms, what we realize is that we are being invited to bring all of ourselves to God with, with complete honesty. If you just read through the Psalms, you're going to read Psalms where the psalmist is expressing his fear to God. You're going to read Psalms where the psalmist is expressing gratitude to God. You're going to read Psalms where the psalmist is expressing anger to God, anger at God. And there's these group of Psalms we call the imprecatory Psalms that the psalmist is literally going to God and asking God to kill another person. God, I would like for you to take that person out. And so these psalms, they're all over the place because we are all over the place. Our human experience, we feel so deeply and the psalms invite us in to express everything that is in us to God. And the pattern that we see in the Psalms, though, goes like this, where the psalmist is going to open his psalm with whatever's going on with him. Anger, frustration, anxiety, fear, thanksgiving, delight, praise, gratitude, whatever it is. He's going to start the psalm with wherever he's at. Then there's going to be meditation, remembrance of God's word. And then there's going to be delight. The psalm's going to end with delight in God's word. Now, a reminder that, that because we have God's word, right, we can yield fruit in season. And that we're going to be cared for in the midst of hardship. And that there is prosperity waiting for us. Biblical prosperity. This, this pattern in the psalms, we can be perfectly honest with where we are to God. We meditate on the word of God. And then that brings delight to the soul. And notice how here in Psalm 1, as we get this pattern, that the rest of the Psalms are going to follow, how the goal of meditation is not knowledge, it's delight. And delight is a feeling. Delight is a feeling, right? It's not a thought. I can tell you I'm happy, but not feel happy, right? Any of us can do that. And that's not what God wants from you. He doesn't want you to pretend that you delight in his word. He doesn't want you to pretend that you believe in him or have faith. No, God wants that really what's going on inside your gut is you're experiencing delight in faith in belief in him, which means that God wants us to bring to him the very things that are going on inside of us. He wants us to come to him with complete honesty. And here's the deal. Delight in God's word is produced in us in the exact same way that fear is and dismay and anxiety and bitterness and inadequacy and imposter syndrome. All of those things are produced, those feelings, they're produced in the same way inside of us. And that is through meditation. Meditation. Fixating ourselves on something. It does something inside of us and we start the flywheel going. And what God wants is he wants to get the flywheel of us meditating on his word and that producing delight in us, that producing rootedness in us, and that flywheel to continue to spin. He doesn't want us to experience being like the chaff that is blown in the wind. And here in verse 4, the imagery there is of someone going to the threshing floor with some wheat and they beat it and the grain falls to the threshing floor and the chaff, just all of the lightweight husk and stuff gets blown away in the wind because there's no substance to it at all. And when, when we meditate on the things of the world, there's no substance there. There's no delight there for our souls and God wants us to experience true delight in rootedness. And that come, brings us to point number three together. And that's this, is that God is inviting us into a life of delight. 
God is inviting us into a life of delight. Look at verses five and six. It says, therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The Lord knows the way of the righteous. He knows the way to delight for our souls, and he's inviting us into it. This psalm is inviting us in, and the rest of the psalms are going to do the exact same thing. They're going to invite us in to have complete honesty with what's going on inside of us with God. Going to God, just like we see in the psalms, and being, God, I, I can't get my life together. God, I'm racked with anxiety. God, I'm angry at you for letting these things happen. God, I feel doubt. I don't even know if you're there. God, why are you so silent? God, I'm so angry at this person or that person. I just want you to do something about it. All of these things and even more, God invites us to bring this to him and say, God, I need help. And the reality is this is how our faith begins. Like you can't have faith in Christ unless you go to God and say, God, I need help with my sin. I I, I am wicked. My thoughts are wicked. My intentions are wicked. And, And I can't change that in of myself. I need help. I need the forgiveness that can only be provided to me through what Christ has done on the cross. And I need your gracious intervention in my life. That's the beginning of the Christian faith. I mean, if we go to verse one again, where it talks about those who stand in the way of the wicked and take the counsel of the wicked and sit in the seat of scoffers, that's all of us. Every single one of us can be found in verse 1. And the only way to blessedness is through faith in Christ and then finding delight in the Word of God as we seek to follow it. God invites us into the way of the righteous. It begins with honesty. And then we spend our lives living according to the Word of God, meditating on the Word of God, and then experiencing the delight and the goodness and the sweetness that is life lived according to God's Word. But, you know, this morning, as I said earlier, as God invites us into this life of delight, the question we need to ask is, what am I meditating on? It's not if I'm meditating. No, what am I meditating on? And I think that's a question that all of us, we need to leave this sermon asking ourselves. What are the things that I'm meditating on? And what is it doing to me? Is it bringing delight to my soul? Or is it more like being chaff that's blown away in the wind? No substance whatsoever. You know, um, the other day I was uh, doing my quiet time. I was reading uh, scripture. I was here in our church offices, sitting on the couch. I had a meeting coming up and some space. And I just thought I would spend some time reading the word and praying and journaling. So I was sitting on the couch, doing those things. And before I knew it, I was scrolling Facebook, right? That ever happened to you? Where you're in the middle of a nice quiet time with the Lord, reading scripture and all of a sudden, whoa, wow, I found myself on social media. Happens to me, happens to all of us. All right. So I'm scrolling Facebook. And as I'm scrolling Facebook, um, I see that it's this particular person's birthday. So, oh, click their profile, kind of check it in on them, what's going on in their lives, what have they posted recently, looking at their profile. And then I saw that this person was friends with another person. That caught my eye. And so I clicked their profile, started to look up, oh, what's going on? with them. Now, have you ever done this before where you start to kind of go down what I call the rabbit hole of social media? Yeah, the rabbit hole of meditation. That's what's going on here. And so I'm looking at this other person's profile. Now, it just happens to be that for this particular person, they were someone who just a while back had really hurt me. Um, I I think I feel still a lot of frustration and bitterness towards this person. And 
Um, they had even at one point written me an email that was really, really hurtful. And before I knew it, I, I, I had gotten my computer out, searched for that email that they sent me, and was reading that email. Now, I, I didn't realize the progression that I had gone down to get to that place where I'm going from my quiet time to looking at Facebook through these steps all the way to now I have the email up and I'm reading it and I'm feeling all of the feelings of bitterness and frustration and hurt and anger because the flywheel of meditation was just spinning out of control here. And it dawned on me what I had done. All of a sudden, I was like, what am I doing? Why am I reading this email? How did I even get here? And fortunately, right after that, I had a meeting with Evan and Melody from our staff, and we were sitting down, and I just kind of contested to him. I was like, guys, man, this is just what happened, and this is what I'm feeling, and I was just so thankful for them because they were able to minister to me and encourage me and uh, exhort me in, in that very moment. But I had to identify there, what am I meditating on? And what is it doing to me? And I need help from other people to identify that because that is robbing my soul of delight. And God wants a life of delight for you. That's what he's aiming at. And his word produces that in us. So my question for you is, what are you meditating on? Where do you get caught in that flywheel? Where are you going down the rabbit hole of meditation? What is that doing inside of you? I really encourage you to think about this question. Maybe even uh, call someone up, grab a friend, and sit down, watch this sermon, listen to it, have them listen to it, and be like, man, I really want to talk about what am I meditating on? Let's chat about this. Let's identify this because you are what you meditate on. It is doing something to your soul. And God is inviting you into a life of delight. And His Word will produce that. And so I hope you'll join us as we study the Psalms. We're going to see this pattern where God asks us to bring perfect honesty to Him. God, here's what is going on inside of me. And then we're going to be directed to the Word of God to meditate on that and to experience delight. That's how you stop the flywheel of meditation on the things of the world. We bring ourselves honestly to the Lord and to one another. We get directed to his word and we experience the delight of it. I hope that you'll think about sitting down with someone and asking the question, what am I meditating on? Let me pray. God, just thankful for you. I'm thankful for the word. I'm just thankful how it produces delight in us. Lord, I just pray you'd give us the grace to be able to think about and identify the things in our lives that we do meditate on, uh, the things that we obsess on, that we fixate on, and that we would really be honest with ourselves about what it's doing to us. But Lord, also help us to know that we can bring any of that to you, that the Psalms invite us to bring our full selves to you, that you can handle it, and that all you want to do is point us to a life of delight. Lord, help us to trust you in that. We love you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.